Welcome to another deep dive. This time we're taking a look at quantum computing, specifically this academic paper. Um, quantum computing at the quantum advantage threshold. Quite a mouthful. It is. But it's fascinating stuff and we're going to unpack it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting, really relevant for where we're at right now with this tech. Absolutely. So one of the things this paper jumps right into is this idea of Moore's Law and whether it's ending or not. Right. And it's something that's been generating a lot of buzz lately. What's the take in this paper? So Moore's Law basically predicts that the number of transistors on a microchip will double every two years. Right. It has been the driver of the exponential growth of computing power. But the thing is, we're hitting physical limits. We can only make transistors so small, right? Exactly. You can only get so small. Right. But this paper argues that Moore's Law isn't quite dead yet. There's some life left in it. Ah, interesting. So what are they proposing? How do they see Moore's Law extending? Well, they talk about things like 3D layering of transistors. Okay, so like instead of just single-story buildings, we're going skyscrapers on these chips. Exactly. And also new architectures and materials, you know, going beyond silicon. They estimate this could actually extend Moore's Law for another three decades. Three decades. That's a yeah. lot of time. So if classical computing still has room to grow, why all the urgency to develop quantum computing? Why do we need this new type of computing? You're right. It is a good question. And they address that head on. Because even with these advances, there are fundamental limits to what classical computers can do. Yeah. The ones and A's. That's all you got. At the end of the day, they're still based on bits. Right. Which can only be a zero or a one. But quantum computing, well, it leverages the weirdness of quantum mechanics. It works in a totally different way. Yeah, this is where it gets mind-bending. Oh, yeah. We move from bits to quibits. Right. Which can be in this superposition. Yeah. Both zero and one at the same time. The paper uses the spin of an electron. I always imagine, like, flipping a coin and it landing on heads and tails at the same time. It's a great analogy. Does that work? It does. So imagine an electron spinning clockwise as a one and counterclockwise is a zero. But in superposition, it's spinning both ways at once. Whoa, okay. And then you get multiple quibits entangled. Their fates are linked. Entanglement, yeah. Even if they're separated, like physically far apart. It's like you flip one coin and you instantly know what the other one's gonna be no matter how far apart they are. Yeah, it's wild. It really is. It's often called spooky action at a distance. I love that. Yeah. But you can't use it to send information faster than light. I've tried. Sadly, no. This paper makes that point very clear. Instantaneous, yes, but not faster than light. But what you do get, get is this massive parallel processing power. It's all packed into this tiny chip, right? Exactly. But the paper emphasizes that it's not just about raw power. It's about how that power is harnessed. And this is where we get to the different types of quantum computers. Yeah, the different models. The different models. Right? Because there's not just one. It can feel like a quantum buffet. You get yeah. your gate-based, your one-way adiabatic. It can be a little overwhelming. Where do we even start? Let's start with, I think, the one that's most similar to classical computing, which is the gate-based model. Yeah, the gate-based model. So you use quantum gates, which are uh, analogous to logic gates in classical computing, right. to manipulate these quibits. And these gates can, you know, flip the quibit state put it into superposition, or even entangle it with another one. Right, just like our A and D or our not gates. Exactly. And by strategically combining these gates, you can actually create quantum circuits, which are basically the quantum programs, right? It's like the instructions, the recipe for the quantum computer. Right. So you put these gates together in a specific order, and you can create algorithms that perform these really specific computations. It's kind of intuitive if you're coming from a classical computing background. So that's the gate-based. Mm -hmm. All right, what about... Uh, the one-way model. That one sounds a little less intuitive to me. Yeah, it definitely requires a bit of a mental shift. Um, so instead of applying gates sequentially, you start with a highly entangled state of quibits. It's called a cluster state. And by performing measurements on specific quibits, you essentially steer the computation. You set it up and you let it go like a chain reaction. Exactly. So the computation is encoded in that initial state and the measurements kind of nudge it along. This is really well suited for optical quantum computing, which uses photons. The light. Light, yes. Where generating those two quibit gates can be really difficult. Now onto our third model, adiabatic quantum computing. That one always makes me think of like 
gently nudging a system towards a solution, like you're slowly rolling a ball down a hill and it settles at the lowest point. That's such a good analogy. Does that work? It totally does. You're slowly evolving the system's energy landscape. The solution is the lowest energy state and it's really good for optimization problems. So finding the most efficient roads or managing financial portfolios. Sounds like each of these models has its sweet spot, its area where it shines. Right, they all have strengths and weaknesses, right? They're all universal in the sense that they can theoretically solve any computational problem that a classical computer can and more, but one might be better than the other depending on the task and what hardware is available. And the paper even talks about some hybrid approaches like variational quantum computing. Hybrid, so you're taking the best of different models and combining them. Yeah, it's really clever. So it uses a quantum circuit, but it has adjustable parameters. Oh, and then it uses a classical computer to optimize those parameters based on the results. Mm -hmm. So it's like this feedback loop between the classical and quantum worlds. And that's really promising for those NISQ devices. NISQ, noisy intermediate scale quantum. Right. That's what we have today. Right, limited koi bits higher error rates. It's a way to get the most out of what we have now as we try to build those bigger, more stable quantum computers. Oh, it's like working with the tools we have while we wait for the better tools to come along. Exactly. But it's not just about the universal models. There are also these specialized quantum computers designed for very specific tasks. We have quantum simulators, which are purpose-built. They mimic specific quantum systems. It gives us a window into these really complex phenomena. It's like building a scale model of a molecule instead of trying to program a computer to understand it. Yes, exactly. And then there's the D-Wave annealer, which tackles optimization problems like that classic traveling salesman problem. Finding the shortest route between a bunch of cities, right? Exactly. And that quickly overwhelms a classical computer because the number of possibilities explodes exponentially. Right. It gets out of control really fast. But a quantum annealer can explore lots of potential solutions at the same time. Makes it way faster for those types of problems. So we've got this whole spectrum from general purpose to highly specialized. But something the paper makes very clear is that judging a quantum computer isn't as simple as counting qubits. Oh, absolutely not. It's not a qubit popularity contest. There's more to it. It's so much more than that. Qubit count is just one piece of the puzzle. It's a complex interplay of factors. Error rate, coherence time, connectivity, gate speed, and even programmability. Okay, let's break those down a bit. Error rate, that one seems pretty straightforward. We want our calculations to be accurate. But what about coherence time? So think of it this way. It's how long a qubit can maintain its quantum state before it decoheres. Before it loses its quantumness, right? Exactly, like a soap bubble. Yeah. The longer it stays intact, the better. Interactions with the environment cause that bubble to burst, and that leads to errors. So the longer the coherence time, the more complex the calculations you can do before errors start creeping in. Yes, precisely. And then there's connectivity. That refers to how easily qubits can interact with each other on the chip. High connectivity is key for complex calculations. It's like having a good transportation system. You want to move information between those qubits easily. Absolutely. And gate speed, I assume that's how fast you can perform operations on those qubits. That's it. The faster the gates, the faster the computations. Makes sense. And then finally, there's programmability. How easy is it to reconfigure the quantum computer for different tasks? So it's like having a flexible operating system. Can it run different software? Exactly. It's like judging a car. You don't just look at the horsepower. You consider like the fuel efficiency, the handling, the safety features. I love that analogy. Right. There are all these things that factor in. It's a great comparison. And achieving quantum advantage where a quantum computer outperforms any classical computer requires that balance, a balance of all those factors, not just a ton of qubits. Right, and one of the biggest hurdles we face is those pesky errors. Oh, yes. Even the best qubits are prone to noise and decoherence, and that just throws everything off. It does, and it's a real challenge because unlike in classical computing, you can't just copy a qubit. You can't just hit quirtle plus C, quirtle plus V? Nope. The no cloning theorem in quantum mechanics prevents that. Quantum rule. They do. But we have some brilliant people out there who have found clever ways to detect and correct those errors without actually measuring the qubits because that would destroy the quantum states. It's like fixing a clock without opening it up and looking at the gears. 
How does that even work? A lot of the approaches involve using redundant quibits. So instead of storing information in a single quibit, you spread it out over multiple quibits in a very specific way. So it's like having a backup system. Exactly. And then by doing measurements on certain subsets of those quibits, you can actually detect if there's an error. You can even figure out which quibits messed up. That's incredible. It is, and there are a bunch of different error correction codes out there. Each one has its trade-offs. Oh, of course. The higher the error rate of your physical quibits, the more redundant quibits you need for error correction. Yeah. Which makes things more complex. Right, more complex and more expensive. It's a constant battle. It is a constant battle to improve the quality of those quibits and come up with even better ways to correct those errors. But the paper highlights some amazing progress in different quantum computing platforms. Yeah, it's well, happening. So who are the major players in this quantum race? What are the different platforms? All right, so we've explored the inner workings of these quantum computers, different models, the challenges they face. But what does it all mean for us? How's it going to change our lives? Right, that's the big question. What can we actually do with this tech? Exactly. And the paper brings up this really interesting parallel between quantum computing and the development of lasers. Oh, yeah. Remember how lasers were mainly a research tool? Mm -hmm. But eventually they ended up in like barcode scanners and CD players. Mm -hmm everywhere. It's a great analogy. Quantum computing will probably follow a similar path from specialized scientific uses to more widespread adoption over time. So where are we on that timeline? What are some of the early applications, the things that give us a glimpse into the future? Well, one area where we're already seeing an impact is scientific breakthroughs. Quantum simulators are helping us understand really complex phenomena in physics, chemistry, material science, Things that we couldn't study directly before. So instead of relying on theoretical models, we can actually simulate these complex systems and get real data. Exactly. Think about high temperature superconductivity. Okay. Go that could totally change how we transmit energy. Huge. Classical computers struggle to simulate those interactions, but quantum simulators, they're giving us insights that could lead to a future where we have energy transmission with almost no loss. Whoa. That's like... A world with ultra-efficient power grids, devices that never need charging. It's mind-blowing. The paper also talks about quantum advantage demonstrations. What are those all about? Quantum advantage, sometimes it's called quantum supremacy. It's a really important milestone. It's when a quantum computer does something definitively better than any classical computer for a specific task. It's proof that we've entered a new era of computing. It's that moment like when the Wright brothers plane took off for the first time. You're like, okay, this is something completely new. This is groundbreaking. And we've seen a few of these demonstrations already. For example, Google's Sycamore processor did it back in 2019. They used it to sample the output of random quantum circuits. That would have taken a classical supercomputer thousands of years to do. Thousands of years. Sycamore did it in just a few minutes. Okay, now sampling the output of random quantum circuits, I gotta admit that sounds a little, uh, abstract. Yeah, it's not the most intuitive thing. Can you break that down for us non-physicists? What does that even mean? Sure. So imagine you have a quantum circuit. It's basically a sequence of quantum gates applied to qubits. The yeah. output is a string of zeros and ones. But the probability of getting a specific string depends on the structure of the circuit. And calculating those probabilities is really hard for classical computers, especially for large circuits. A quantum computer, though, can run the circuit a bunch of times and measure the outcomes. It's basically a snapshot of that probability distribution. So it's like flipping a really weird quantum coin a bunch of times and seeing what patterns come up. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. And Sycamore was way, way faster than any classical computer at doing this. Exactly. And there are other approaches, too, like boson sampling. This one uses photons, particles of light. Okay. And it solves a problem that's really hard for classical computers. What kind of problem? It involves sending photons through a complex network of waveguides and then measuring the output. It's kind of like a game of quantum pinball. I like that, quantum pinball. So... We've got these demonstrations. Quantum advantage is real. These computers can do things better than classical computers. But what about practical applications? Right. Things that will affect our lives. Well, one promising area is generating truly random numbers. Random numbers. Okay. I didn't see that coming. Why is that such a big deal? Because it's surprisingly hard to generate truly random numbers using a classical computer. Most methods use algorithms that start with a seed. So the numbers aren't really random. They're just unpredictable. It's like shuffling a deck of cards that's already in a predetermined order. 
You might not know the next car, but it's not actually random. Exactly. But with quantum mechanics, you've got this inherent randomness. A quantum computer can use that to generate numbers that are certified random based on the laws of physics. So it's like a quantum dice that you know is always fair. Yeah. No more loaded dice in the quantum casino. <laughs> but seriously, this has implications beyond gambling, right? Oh, absolutely. Certifiable random numbers could revolutionize cryptography because the security of encryption relies on the quality of the random numbers used to generate keys. So our online transactions or communications could become more secure thanks to quantum computers. That's one of the potential benefits, yeah. And beyond cryptography, you need random numbers for scientific simulations, statistical analysis, even lotteries. A quantum lottery, where the numbers are truly unpredictable. Yeah. That would be something else. It would. Another application the paper talks about is sampling probability distributions, which is important for machine learning. Okay, probability distributions. Without making my head spin, can you explain that one? Okay, so imagine you're trying to predict who's going to win an election. Right. You've got polling data. Right. That gives you a probability distribution, the likelihood of each candidate winning. Sampling that distribution means, like, picking a bunch of voters randomly and seeing who they support to get a better idea of the overall distribution. So quantum computers could analyze complex data, like election polls, more efficiently and accurately. Yes. And that's a big deal for machine learning because those algorithms often need to sample probability distributions to learn from data and make predictions. Quantum computers could speed that up a lot, leading to more powerful, accurate AI. This is starting to sound really futuristic, but the paper also mentions cryptanalysis, the science of breaking codes. Mm. That part makes me a little nervous, honestly. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. It is a double-edged sword, right? Yeah. Quantum computers can make data more secure, but they could also threaten current encryption methods. Those methods rely on the difficulty of factoring large numbers, which takes a classical computer a long time. But a powerful enough quantum computer could do it much faster. And then those encryption methods would be vulnerable. It's like having a master key that could unlock any door. In a way, yes. It's not an immediate threat. Those quantum computers are still years, if not decades, away. But it I is a concern. And researchers are already working on new encryption methods, ones that can withstand those quantum attacks. It's a race against time. It is. But hopefully we're prepared. So it's like a cybersecurity arms race. Right. We need to develop quantum-resistant encryption before the quantum hackers get too powerful. Yeah. It's a good reminder that any powerful technology, it has benefits and risks. We need to be mindful of both sides. Absolutely. Well, this is a lot to think about. We've talked about simulating the universe, breaking codes. It seems like we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. What else can we expect as quantum computing keeps evolving? Welcome back to the deep dive. We've been on quite a journey from quibits and entanglement to those quantum advantage demos. But now, let's look ahead. How will this technology change the world around us? It really does spark the imagination. It does. Quantum computers have the potential to revolutionize so many industries. Medicine, material science, finance. We're talking about a transformative era. The paper really zooms in on those economically impactful applications, putting them into three categories simulation, optimization, and machine learning. We touched on quantum simulators earlier, but let's dig a bit deeper. How can they solve real world problems beyond just research? Simulation is about understanding those really complex systems and so many industries deal with this, right? Developing new drugs, designing materials, you're dealing with countless variables, interactions, it gets complicated fast. And classical computers, they often hit a wall. They can't simulate these systems accurately enough. They just can't keep up. But quantum computers, they're different. They offer a real advantage there. So it's like having a virtual lab. Yes. Where you can run experiments, test different scenarios without the time and expense of real world trials. Exactly. Imagine being able to simulate how a drug molecule interacts with a biological target at the atomic level. Wow. That could revolutionize drug discovery, design new drugs faster, more precisely, oh, yeah. speed up the development of treatments for diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's. The potential impact on human health is incredible. What about material science? I remember reading about designing new materials with properties that we thought were impossible. It's one of the most exciting areas. By simulating the behavior of those atoms and molecules, we could discover materials that are stronger but lighter more efficient at conducting electricity, maybe even self-healing materials. Self-healing, it's straight out of science fiction. But how would this play out 
in the real world, what would those applications look like? Well, imagine batteries that last 10 times longer, solar panels that are twice as efficient, lightweight materials that could change aerospace or transportation. Those are just a few examples. It really is incredible to think about. So we've got simulation changing medicine and material science. What about optimization? How can quantum computers help us find the best solutions? Optimization is everywhere. Finding the best delivery routes, managing traffic in cities, optimizing financial portfolios. We're always trying to find that optimal solution, but there are just so many possibilities and it becomes too much for classical computers to handle. It's like trying to solve a giant Sudoku puzzle. Right. Way too many combinations to try them all. And that's where quantum computers come in. They can explore many possibilities at the same time. They're much better suited for these optimization problems. They could change logistics, finance, even urban planning. That would be huge for businesses and governments. And then there's machine learning, which is already changing everything. How could quantum boost that even further? Well, machine learning relies heavily on linear algebra. You're manipulating matrices and vectors, and quantum computers could potentially do those calculations exponentially faster. Wow, exponentially faster. Which means you could speed up machine learning tasks significantly, train more powerful AI models, make more accurate predictions. So we could have AI systems that analyze tons of data, find patterns we'd never see, and make super accurate predictions mm -hmm. in medicine, finance, climate science. Exactly. Imagine AI that diagnoses diseases earlier, more accurately, predicts natural disasters better, develops personalized learning plans for students. The possibilities are huge. It's exciting, but also a little daunting. You know, it feels like we're on the edge of something really big. We are, but it's important to remember we're still early in this quantum journey. There are technical hurdles for sure. We need new algorithms, new software to really use these computers to their full potential. It's not enough to build the machine. We have to learn how to program it, how to talk to it so it can solve those problems. Exactly. And there are also ethical and societal questions. Like with any powerful technology, it could be used for good or bad. We need to have open conversations about those issues. Make sure it's used responsibly, that it benefits everyone. I completely agree. We have to be thoughtful about the consequences and develop guidelines for ethical use. This deep dive into quantum computing has been pretty amazing. We covered a lot of ground. What's the one thing you hope our listeners take away from all of this? That's a good question. The quantum revolution is happening. It's not just a science thing. It's going to change our world. If you're a scientist, an entrepreneur, or just someone who's curious, now is the time to start paying attention. The future is being written in quibits, and it's going to be fascinating to watch it unfold. I love that. Well said. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive into quantum computing. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, keep asking those questions. The quantum world is out there waiting to be discovered.